Okay, I am so fortunate that I'm here with uh, Eric Meyer and Philip Wadler. Um, Philip is from the University of Edinburgh and is one of the huge gurus of Haskell. I remember when I was trying to become a computer scientist, uh, the first book I ever read about functional programming was Bird and Wadler. A fantastic book that I know Eric also has a comment on. And I've had the fortune of bumping into Phil a couple of uh, around uh, Java generics and other mm, things. Yeah. But Eric and Phil have really have a past together. And so it's good <laughs> to see you sitting here and, um, right next to each other. So, so um, Eric, what is the thing about this Bird and Wadler book? Just to so, so the thing with, you know, sometimes when you read a book, it makes you kind of, you know, like feel like you're in heaven. It's just like perfect, it's elegant, it like, you know, it like the world suddenly looks kind of light and shiny and happy. And, you know, Bert and Wadler first edition is one of those books that is really, it, I don't know, it strikes something, you know, in your being um, about the beauty of programming. So the nice thing about with programming, right, you feel like really empowered. And if you read that book, it somehow kind of, you know, conveys this, the, the power of programming and especially, I think, the elegance of functional programming, of pure functional programming, how simple it is, how elegant it is. And for me, that was really, when I read that book, and my copy is from 81, I think, or is that, or when was it written? No, it was 80 written in 87. 87? Oh, oh no, then that's, I was wrong. Well, I, I always said, I wish I would have learned programming for this. <laughs> my, my, because before that, we're doing, you know, Cecil and things like that. Um, but yeah, so first edition of functional programming, the best book ever written on programming. Okay, so um, just to get it once and for all out of the system and move on from the book, was it you or was it Bert who ruined the second edition? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say the second edition was ruined, but the, you have to give, you can say nice things about the book, but the book was two-thirds Richard and one-third me. That we were officially two-thirds and one-third author. He was the senior author. Um, and then the second edition, um, I wrote a little bit and Richard wasn't all that happy with it and that I hadn't completed my bit. So Richard is three-thirds author of the second edition. My, my name doesn't appear on it. Yeah, so the second edition, I think, what but I don't lot, like about it... All, all the things you like about the first edition, I mean, I had something to do with it, yes. a lot of it's Richard. Yeah, but the second edition, is, it was more a Haskell book instead of a functional programming book. It, it was second and, system syndrome. Exactly, and so that kind of removed some of the kind of, you know, shine of it. It become too specific, it would become like a manual more, instead of like about the principles. So that's kind of the mm -hmm. thing what I found a little bit disappointing about so this it. this thing with principles... Um, I mean, you're, you, you're in a university and you're doing theory and all that kind of stuff. And then what's that good for? Having principles and all that. What, 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 what's that all about? In Why would one want to do that? Yeah. Um, because Except that they pay you for having principles, I guess. Sorry. What's good about it is that you can look at the essence of something and then... Uh, later that can turn out to be really useful. So the monad stuff that Eric likes, that was just done like, oh look, there's this little pattern here. This looks exactly like what's going on in a list comprehension. Let me try to understand that. And then I worked that out and then um, people in Pennsylvania looked at that and they said, oh, that's just what we need for databases. And they started applying it to databases. And Phil Trinder and I, Phil was a student of mine, had sort of noticed, oh, this looks a little bit like what's going on in databases. And we wrote one paper that um, got published in the Indian conference. And then they picked that up and really ran with it and did very interesting things and built optimizers and so on based on it. And then Eric picked that up and uh, started to build, um, use the list comprehensions in, sorry, the monad comprehensions in Haskell and use them to generate SQL. And that, that ended up as eventually as LINQ. Mm -hmm. So, how many hundreds or thousands of users does LINQ have? It's probably in the millions. Uh, yes. Yep. So, so that came from just sitting and fiddling around yep. going, oh look, there's a little pattern here. And then you sort of wait 20 years and everybody's using it. Yeah. Um, my, one of my favorite examples is uh, all these logicians at the end of the 19th century just wanted to try to understand um, 
What are numbers? Yeah, which seems pretty obvious, but actually it wasn't obvious back then because calculus involved things like infinitesimals and people weren't sure what infinitesimals or infinitely large things were. They wanted a good basis for this. So they said, okay, let's try to work out what, what's going on. And they came up with symbolic logic. And um, you know, you just, they did that just because they wanted deep understanding of what's going on, and they did it just in time for the stored program computer. And everything they've done turns out to be incredibly useful for the stored program computer. Um, but at the time they were doing it, they had no way of knowing that. If they hadn't done it, it's not clear the stored program computer would have come along when it did. It might have come along a lot later because you know, people like Turing had a big impact on the stored program computer and were logicians, mm -hmm. came out of this community. And I think this is incredibly important to understand right now because um, lots of the government f funding agencies are saying, oh well, we're going into a depression. We better be sure that when we spend our money we get value for it, so we should only invest in research that's economically important. Well, most of the things we have that are important did not come from doing things that people thought were economically important at the time. They came from trying to get at the guts of something and understand what's happening at the guts. Yep, I 100% I agree with you. I think when I look at universities uh, where they're trying to do research that kind of, you know, is applied or directly applicable, that's the wrong thing. They should kind of, you know, really try to find the essence and, you know, probably like 100 years from now or 50 years from now, we will figure out, oh, that is really exactly what's useful. So, and, and it's very hard also to predict, right, which parts of this theory will find a use when and where. Right. It, yeah. it goes both ways. It's really helpful for people in universities to talk to people on the ground um, in industrial settings to get, develop taste about what the interesting problems are. So you don't want to just be in an ivory tower completely isolated, but on the other hand, you certainly don't want somebody breathing down your neck saying, everything you do must be practical, because then you can't do the most practical thing, which is getting at the essence of what's going on. So, so would you say that the things we do in the, uh, in the industry today, the software programming is vastly popular, and we have all kinds of programming languages, technologies that are from a a pure standpoint, uh, messy. Um, would you say that are we generally moving towards greater beauty or accordance with principles as we learn more, or are we just messing things more up? Like, what, what is, what is your feeling of the oh, general well, that's direction? A, that's a very interesting question, right? Because in science, there's this notion of progress, mm -hmm. whereas, say, in the literary world, it's much less clear if you have, you might, you have things change, but is it the same as the progress that you get in the mm -hmm. scientific world? And now you can look at, say, the world of programming languages and say, well, is that progressing or not? And I think that's actually a very interesting question. It's not entirely clear how you go about answering it. What seems very clear is that there's strong economic effects. That means whatever people are doing is a good thing to do because you've got lots of people trained in it. And one thing I would love to see is a scientific study of how those um, networking effects of having lots of people doing one thing interact with the notion of, well, what is the best thing? And how do you um, set things up so that the best thing can eventually become what people are doing? It seems to happen, but to take a lot of time. So I work in the functional programming community, and we spent ages saying, well, you know, we think this is the way to do things, but people aren't doing things this way. They, they seem to know this other stuff and be doing this other stuff. Um, but now, all of a sudden, you have lots of ideas from functional languages ending up in the mainstream. Right? Garbage collection is now considered very mainstream. This used to be something that only those strange functional programming people mm -hmm. did. Um, lambda expressions, um, anonymous functions, are now showing up in uh, C Sharp and uh, Python and Perl and sort of everywhere you can name, but they came out of the mm -hmm. functional programming community. List comprehensions, which I didn't invent, but I got to invent the name, okay. <laughs> uh, now show up in things like Python, um, it, as well as showing up in LINQ. So um, all these ideas are beginning to get out there, and that's great. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. It'll also be interesting to see if 
you know, they'll drop some ideas and then forget us again, or if it will accelerate. It's, it's very unclear what's going to happen. Uh -huh. So, um, so when I ask you a question that could have been just a matter of personal opinion, you actually so you start talking about the science that would be interesting to do about that question. That mm. You're very um, amazingly a scientist. So um, the next one will have to be more of a, um, a personal gut feeling, I think. But given that you did these things 20 and 30 years ago in, in theory that are now becoming mainstream, do you think the people who, who sort of go against the, the short-term investments and actually do deep fundamental research today, do you think their ideas have the same chance of making it into the mainstream as your ideas from back then sure. turned out to do. If you think about computing, computing is at most maybe 50 years old, 60 years old. That's how long we've had stored program computers. Think of how old something like physics is. Right. So there's a lot of low-lying low fruit on the ground. And I think this is absolutely the best time to be involved in computing. What I tell all my students is, you're working at the best time. Um, you know, somebody in this new generation is going to be the Isaac Newton of computing and discover principles as fundamental as what Newton discovered. So now it's absolutely the best time to be doing it and the best time to be thinking deep thoughts. Any insights for me to bet on the stock market on what, what <laughs> principles will those be? <laughs> like what direction are we, I know you can't, you don't have those principles or, or you, you would have shared them, but what, what are the directions that computer science are moving in that you see as being really promising for shaping the future of, of computing? Well, I think the thing that I'm most interested to see where it goes is all of a sudden we're ending up with all these multi-cores. We're also ending up with computers spread out all over the world with the internet. So concurrency and distribution are incredibly important. We've been working on these problems for years, but I wouldn't say any consensus has emerged as to what a good way of doing things is. There's consensus that what people are doing currently in industry is not the right way, but I don't think there's any consensus about what is the right way. And all of a sudden, those problems are the bottleneck to making any progress in computing. Moore's Law is going to go away unless we learn how to exploit concurrency. Right, because so, it, it only talks about number of transistors, right. not about the speed of any Right. So what process. really worries me, in fact, is that I think we have some interesting solutions to make it out there, but quite possibly not yet the right solutions. And what's been shown is that things tend to take at least 20 years to get from theory into practice. So if we still have to develop the good theory for distribution, and concurrency, what the real world is going to do twiddling its thumb for 20 years, I don't know. So maybe we're about to see a huge acceleration in the rate at which things move from um, theory into practice. We'll see. Possibly because there's more of a, there's more of a demand for a theory for this, um, whereas maybe no one came actually asking for logic to be applied in, in practical computing back then. Is that why you think there might Something be more Something like that, yeah. Isn't that kind of like what you said up front, though, the the industry, industry sort of breathing down your neck saying, uh, you know, give us monetizable research. Well, actually, industry now. isn't. The government is saying, oh, you need to be doing oh. practical stuff. Industry knows better. They don't always say that. Industry says, no, no, please let them do their thing. Okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and then the other half of this, the, the very practical half, uh, that I think industry does appreciate is if you have somebody trained in theoretical techniques, then you can write down in half a page, say, what the type rules for your language are or what the rewrite rules for the compiler are. Um, I did this today and put them up on the wall and somebody said, and I said, wait a minute, that bit's wrong. So if you can write it down very briefly, then you have a really nice, concise, easy to study guide to writing the code. And so I think that's the other way in which theory really helps. It gives you very simple tools for describing very concretely what you're going on about and for reasoning about it, rather than just sort of mm -hmm. thinking about it vaguely or writing it down in words. You can think about it more concretely and write it down in symbols. And that's where theory really helps sharpen things. So what you're saying is the movement from theory to very, very useful practice is not just one that happens from a scientist, scientist's brain to, through a long uh, process to some other practitioner doing it, but it's something that every individual uh, can undertake. Like by mm -hmm. having a deep theoretical mm -hmm. approach you can be more useful in practice? Yeah. 
I know that both you and Eric are trained in relevant theory. I know that both of you have done good things because well, we you've taken the yes. training and applied it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That's a very cool insight. Thanks for coming. <laughs>